Dr. Coomer, to say next when you want the next slides. Sounds good. All righty. So my name is Dr. Cagney Coomer. I am a 2022 Hannah H. Gray Fellow, and I am doing my postdoc at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College. Next. I graduated with a dual bachelor's in biology and chemistry from Virginia State University in 2010. I would just assume that since I graduated top of my class that I would come home and get a job and it would just be easy. Like they would just be lining up to give me jobs. It was nothing like that. And so what happened was I would go on job interviews and they would be like, you're really intelligent, but like all of the experience that you have from undergrad is basically a glorified dishwasher. You haven't done any real experiments. You haven't done anything. You don't have real lab skills. And so I wound up getting a job at Speedway and being the manager of Speedway. Um, and one day while I was um, getting ready to close the store, I had the TV on and the BCTC commercial came on and they started talking about the biotechnology program. And I was like, oh, that's what I need. I got the degree. I just need the hands-on experience. This program will give me that experience. So I enrolled. Next. But what I didn't know was that this journey would literally change the complete trajectory of what I thought my life would be like. So I entered the biotechnology program in 2012. I was a part of the first class of biotechnology students at the Bluegrass Community and Technical College. And after my third week of school, one of my professors came up and he was like, I want to write an EBSCOR grant. So EBSCOR is an NSF funded grant that is, is supposed to give funding for research um, in historic for historically excluded individuals. And so we wrote an EBSCOR grant and we started this all girl research group. There were five girls and our research project was twofold. One was to develop a technique for um, growing aloe vera in a laboratory under sterile techniques. And then the second part was to bioengineer aloe vera to produce an oil called bot botulcosine in its gel. And then you could just basically boil off the gel because the gel is 99% water and you'd have concentrated oil. And so my basic part of my um, of the project was to actually develop techniques for growing aloe vera under sterile conditions in a laboratory. So I spent two years at BCTC doing this research and basically they just like, we went all over the country like presenting our research at different conferences, at different fairs, like a lot of different places. And what happened to me at BCTC was I did do the thing I came there to do was get a job. And so I got a job as this, um, as one of the research scientists at the core sequencing facility at University of Kentucky. My job was to optimize the chemistry of the next generation platforms as they came down the pipeline. So like when I started my job, it took about 16 days. It cost a little over hundred grand to sequence the human genome. I worked there for two years. I optimized ion torrent, 454, alumina, MySeq, all of them. And by the time I left, it cost a little under two grand and we could sequence the human genome in 24 hours. So basically that was my job. And it's, a, it's kind of like an industry job, right? We're trying to make a product. So my job was to get the chemistry in a place where we could create high throughput sequencing and that be what happens. When I got it there, I was still having ideas. So I would like go to my boss and be like, but what if we tweak this? And if we did this and I was reading and he was like, no, stop. This is all I wanted you to do. And you did that. And I was like, okay. He was like, I think you should go to grad school. I was like, what? He was like, I think you should go to grad school. You're a scientist, not a technician. And I was like, yeah, I know I'm a scientist. I come to work every day. I'm doing science. I'm a scientist. He was like, no, 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 no. You need to go to grad school and you need to have a career doing science. And I was like, and how much does that cost? <laughs> and he was like, oh, no, it doesn't cost. It, he basically like explained graduate school to me, told me that I would get a salary and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, this sounds super cool. I'm gonna go home and do my research. So I went home, I did my research and I was like, you gotta take a test to go to grad school. And this test is expensive. 
So the next day I went back to work and he called me in his office and he was like, well, what do you think about grad school? And I was like, you know, it costs almost $300 to take this GRE test. You don't even pay me enough money to take this test and pay my bills. So I can't take this test. So I'm not going to grad school. He was like, oh, that's the only problem. I was like, yeah, he wrote me a check on the spot, enough money to take the test twice. So I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to grad school. But I only took the test once. I pocketed the rest of the money. Um, next slide. Um, so after that, I applied to a bunch of grad schools, but I decided to go to the University of Kentucky because I really didn't know what grad school had entailed. My family lives in Kentucky. It felt like a better idea to quit my job where my safety net was than to quit my job and go somewhere far away. So I interviewed at UK and I got in. I wound up doing my PhD in Dr. Ann Morris's lab where we study retinal development and regeneration. On my first day of interviews, she brought me into the lab and she had this little Petri dish with these little bowls, these little balls in it. And she spun it around and set it under the microscope. And she said, I want you to sit here and I want you to watch. I'll be back in 15 minutes. So I was looking under the microscope. I was like, all I see is little blobs. And then she came back in 15 minutes and she was like, all right, let's go in my office. So we're in her office. We talked for like 30 minutes. She was like, let's go back to the microscope. I went back to the microscope and I didn't even realize it the first time, but I was looking at embryos at the one cell stage. So when I came back in 45 minutes, they were at the four cell stage. And I was like, wait a minute, am I watching development happen like right before my eyes? And she was like, exactly. And I was like, oh, this is for me. I want to do this right here. But what I wound up learning on my journey to get a PhD is that the zebrafish is capable of regenerating its spinal cord, its brain, its heart, its retina, its fin, its intestines, and its stomach. And basically, they can just grow back everything. I call them the piccolo of the animal world because they can literally regenerate everything. If you're not a nerd, that's Dragon Ball Z, just in case people don't know the reference. But anyway... So next slide. I finished my PhD in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. I wound up giving my defense online. It was like 500 people. So although I was upset that I didn't give it to give an in-person defense, the fact that my defense got to be online meant that my family all over the world got to watch me defend my PhD, which was super cool because none of them would have ever have gotten that experience. And also it was just a really great moment. So I got my PhD and before I, I secured my postdoc before and I actually secured my postdoc standing in line at a conference. The keynote speaker was this guy who studied muscles and he gave an hour talk which had 50 something slides and every slide had men on it. There were no women. And so the lady standing right be behind him was standing right in front of me and she tapped him on the shoulder and she said, I need to ask you a question. And he was like, what's up? She was like, it was a great talk, but I was just wondering, do you think women don't have muscles? And he was like, what? She was like, well, every slide had a man on it as if women don't have muscles. So I was just standing behind them, not minding my own business, of course. And I just started naming women. I was like, yeah, Mia Hamm. Don't you know that Venus and Serena Williams are the strongest women in the world? And I was just naming and naming. So then she turned around and started talking to me and me and her were like ping ponging back and forth. And the guy kind of slid away. When he slid away and we turned back around, he wasn't there. She had asked me like, do you want to come have dinner at my table? I was like, sure, why not? I didn't even know who this lady was, but she asked me that I want to have dinner at a table. So I went to her table. We sat down at the table. She started introducing me to people. She's like, this is the president of SDB. This is the editor for sale. This is the editor for development. This is this person, that person, that person. This is Cagney Coomer. She's about to get a PhD from blah, blah, blah. And then she said, and nobody at this table better not offer her a postdoc because I've already decided that she's coming to work in my lab. And I was like, who is this lady? What is happening right now? Why did I choose to sit at this table? Long story short, she is, next slide. She is Dr. Marnie Halperin. She is literally the grandmother of zebrafish research. She is the first person to ever do research and experiments on zebrafish 
in the real world. So she's like super, super famous. And at the time when I met her, she worked at Carnegie. So I thought I was going to go to Carnegie to work, but she got offered the chair position at Dartmouth. So now she's the first woman to ever be chair of a science at Dartmouth College. And I'm her postdoc here. And so once I came to her lab, she does right left brain asymmetry. So basically she func she focuses on understanding the, the synaptic connections of the right side of your body versus this of the right side of your brain versus the synaptic connections on the left side of your brain. And it's really cool and really interesting, but I necessarily do not care about that. But the best part about being a postdoc is that I am not obligated to do her research. I am just here when people ask me what a postdoc is like, I tell them it's like when a doctor finishes medical school, they go to a residency so that they become specified in something. When a PhD finishes their PhD, they go to a postdoc to become specified. So my PhD is in molecular and developmental and cellular biology, but I am actively working as a neuroscientist because that is what I'm being trained to be in my postdoc. Now my postdoc research, next slide, focuses on spinal cord regeneration. I develop in, well, I, it's two focuses. One focus is that I design and develop tools that scientists and doctors can use to map the human brain. So as neuroscientists, we know a lot about individual cells in the brain. We know a lot about their function, their morphology, kind of what they overall do, but the brain doesn't work as single neurons in isolation. They actually work together in connection with one another and form circuits. And these circuits are the main building blocks for brain function. One neuron talks to another neuron that talks to another neuron that tells your hand to raise or tells your eye to blink. But because the brain is so large and there's 68 billion neurons, to date, we have not figured out a cohesive way to map the human brain and those networks. So basically what I do here is that I've designed and developed tools that scientists and doctors are gonna be using in the future to actually be able to map the human brain and understand how it works. Personally, I think that's cool and we need to understand that, but I care more about the regeneration side because humans are not capable of regeneration. But we share a 78% gene similarity to the zebrafish and they are capable of regenerating. What if somewhere in our genome, we have the code to unlock and be able to regenerate? We just haven't figured that out yet. That's what I'm interested in. I plan to take my tools to not only understand how neurons regenerate in both the brain and the spinal cord of the zebrafish, but I'm also extremely interested in understanding once those neurons regenerate, how do they map themselves back into the circuit? When do they turn on? How do they know to turn on? How do they know when to begin functioning? And also, what is going on in the brain while those neurons are regenerating? Are the other neurons in the brain taking over and doing the job to the neuron comes back? Like those are the kind of questions that I plan to um, do in the future. And so last year, I got one of the most prestigious fellowships you can get. I got a Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Hannah H. Gray Fellowship. And this fellowship gives me a nice salary as a postdoc, but what it really does, it is gives me a million dollars to take with me when I leave my postdoc to start my own lab wherever I want to. So that is me and my journey and how I got to the place I am, as well as how actually going to a community college after I had a bit of, after I had a bachelor's degree wound up being the thing I needed to springboard me into the amazing career that I have today.